years. It's going to be that. It's going to be that in front of you. It's going to be a year. It's amazing how fast a year goes. While I get my computer set up here, I'm going to uh, reflect back. I, I was just thinking, <coughs> fifth year right now. We did one in St. Lucia, one on the ship, two in St. John's. So it's like we've had a discussion going for five years. Uh, and I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the opportunity to do that. I'll use my big time on this. Um, so last year, when I was in St. John's, you know, we, we reflected back on 2018, looking ahead of 2019, and I was looking at my, uh, I was looking at my notes, um, and I remember talking about 19 probably being a difficult year, uh, not just for, not just for uh, my amount of door, but the whole country, um, and the numbers did definitely reflect that. Um, it's not because construction necessarily slowed down. It was kind of bipolar um, in terms of the country. Certain kind of parts of the country definitely, uh, you could say, were an economic recession or, or, or um, uh, construction recession. Some parts were just coming off really big 2018 years. And I think the latter was probably the biggest case. And that was certainly true to a great extent in Newfoundland and Labrador. So we'll kind of put that in context and say, OK, using that as a base, how do we go forward? So like I like, I usually do, I like to step out of the province, I like to step out of sometimes the country, look at the big picture. What's happening around Canada? What's happening around Newfoundland and Labrador that's gonna affect construction activity for the next year? Actually, I kinda like to look at it short term, next year, midterm, beyond 2020, and long term. And there's two, three different views of people who live because that seems to be prudent for, uh, for construction these days. So, uh, let's kind of take a look at the big picture, what's going on in the world. And this is really important, and I often, often, I mean, I, 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 in 2019 I did 47 of these, mostly on economics and demographics, some, mostly, te these days, technology as well, I'll talk a little bit about technology, um, to thousands of people. I have to say that, I'm actually, it's really cool that I can actually do this wearing this outfit. I don't get the chance to do that forever, so I really appreciate it. It's a totally different vibe for me. Um, but I often get the question, why step out of construction? What does this have to do with construction? Actually, this has everything to do with construction. Um, because one of the things that have happened more and more in the last 20 years in the construction industry is we have to really watch the private sector because the private sector reacts to this stuff. And they turn on and turn on investment uh, in spite of economic fundamentals. And I'll give you an example. You could have you could have the most um, favorable commercial vacancy rates in your downtown core, but the private sector will not invest if they think crap's about to hit the fan economically. And that's so true in construction. I can give you several examples as we get into that. So we pay attention to this stuff, and it's important. So generally, when you look at the world right now, um, for the past few years, the U.S. economy has been propping up the global economy. It's that simple. China has slowed down from an absolute speed of sound pace to a very quick sprint. Now most countries in the world, if not all countries, would absolutely gladly take China's year over year growth rates. But the fact is when China slows down, they consume less. And they're consuming a lot more, especially resources, which are, are really important to the world and definitely important to your province. So China broadly has slowed down. The US, for a lot of reasons, and we'll talk a bit about the US here, has picked up and has had a very strong economic run going back probably now on a six year, six year, seven year steady growth stream. It goes beyond 16. Um, I know there's a lot of debate on when this started and why it started. My opinion, and I'll get into this now on the economic side, or sorry, the economic side, um, the US economy is, I would argue, overheated. It's been artificially extended. Now, what does that mean? It means that we're playing with fire. Right? And anytime you overly, anytime you extend an economy beyond its natural cycle, how do you extend an economy? You lower taxes when you probably shouldn't lower taxes. You keep interest rates low when you probably should be raising them. Uh, you overheat an economy, and it's good because you make a lot of money and people are working and you have zero unemployment. The problem is, is that everything that goes up comes down, it has to come down. Um, and the U.S. economy is due for a correction. And the question is, how big will that correction be? And what will happen? And we have to pay attention to that. We really do. Uh, as Canadians, as uh, Newfoundlanders, you have to pay attention to that because 80% of what we produce ends up in that country. So when the U.S. slows down, um, it's nice when it slows down predictably because we see it coming. But when it slows down quickly, which it could, 
um, it's very disruptive. So the U.S. economy is something you have to watch over the next 12 months for two reasons primarily. One, in my humble opinion, it's overextended and it's due for a correction. And two, more than anything, it's a fall. It's election year. It's a big deal. And, and why it's a big deal is because the whole world will watch to see what direction the U.S. goes in, and that will define political policy, it will define social policy, it will define everything. And, and, and you know, quite frankly, it will disrupt the markets over the next 12 months. So a lot going on economically in the next 12 months just from our biggest trading partner. You add the fact that Brexit has finally happened, it's finally voted through, what will that do to Europe? What's going to happen in China over the next 12 months, especially in the context of the coronavirus, this is probably the only time I'll talk about the coronavirus, but you have to talk about it, because SARS had an effect on the economy. It actually um, uh, it cost the global economy about $2 trillion back in 2003, and this virus is actually spreading faster and has affected more people. So you've got to pay attention to that, notwithstanding the fact it could be a complete um, uh, fa uh, false alarm in terms of global concern. But the fact is, less people are traveling to China, less stuff's coming out of China, and slowing down the economy, and that will have an effect. So, the reason I bring all this up is because I can sit here and say, this is what's going to happen in the final lab over the next 12 months, you know? There's some really good signs here, there's some bad signs here, but this is what you should expect. All bets are off if coronavirus turns into a global epidemic. All bets are off if the U.S. economy decides to correct itself very abruptly in the next six months, unexpected, like it did in 2008. We had no idea. I remember that. We woke up in the fall. Oh, there were signs. There were signs in September of 2008. The Canadian dollar was at par with the U.S. All of a sudden, the banks started failing. Banks would never fail. And it disrupted the global economy for a decade. So I say this as a caveat, almost an asterisk. Because everything I say in terms of where construction is likely going to lead based on the project data we see is affected by stuff like this. You've got to pay attention to this stuff. We talk a lot about politics. I don't like to talk about politics, but you have to talk about politics. The bottom line is, it doesn't matter what's happening in the rest of the world, specific to Canada, specific to Newfoundland and Labrador. I don't know why I lost this one, but there it is. Um, specific to Newfoundland and Labrador, the U.S. election in the next 12 months is going to have an effect, positive or negative, on the Canadian economy. More than likely, it'll slow it down a little bit, because everything kind of pauses and waits to see what happens. Because ideologically, the U.S. is going to decide which way it's going to go for the next four years. And it's important. Um, in terms of construction as a whole, like I said, there are three views in construction. Whether you're looking at it provincially, whether you're looking at it nationally or globally, there are three views, and you have to look at it this way. There's a short-term view over the next year, there's a mid-term view beyond 2020, there's a long-term view. I can tell you with absolute confidence, the long-term view for construction, whether you live in your province or you live in Atlantic Canada or you live in Nationally, the long-term view for construction is very positive. We are viewed in the world as a bullish construction economy with a very long-term growth outlook. Why? Two primary reasons, and I'm going to get into this in a second. Demographically, Canada's demographics, now demographics are always important in construction. They're always. People move into provincially, you guys know that as well as anybody. It affects your economy, positive or negative. Um, but there's no country in the first world that is letting more people in, in terms of growth, Growth year over year population in Canada, not even close. Canada is the fastest growing nation in the world through pure inter world migration. Uh, we're not having a lot of babies, we're letting people in. And I'll explain why that's the case. It's really important for our economy. That's number one. So when you, when you have population growth, it has a long term bullish outlook on construction because your cities are growing, your provinces are growing, and you need to build stuff for them. That's number one. Number two, and you guys know this as well as anybody. We have a lot of resources. Resources are very cyclical, whether it's oil and gas. Or, uh, uh, but the fact is the world needs resources. It needs resources more uh, than it ever has needed resources. Regardless of the economic flow, the long-term outlook for resource demand, especially nickel, iron, ore, uh, those two specifically, lithium, are huge. And we have the biggest deposits in the world. And you guys certainly are very rich in iron, ore, and nickel. I'll explain what that means for your province long-term. So the long-term outlook, for construction is very bullish. We are, in a, we are in an industry that is growing faster than the Canadian economy. There's very few construction industries in the world that can say that, so we're punching more than our weight. Um, the midterm view is, is a little bit more clear. The short-term view over the next year is very cloudy. And the reason it's cloudy is there are signs that says, even in your province, I'll get into the specifics, 
where you should have some good solid recovery in your industry. There's some positive things happening in the oil and gas and the resource sector. There's money being invested in public infrastructure. But a lot of these things, especially the private sector, can be delayed, abandoned, deferred based on some of the things I've talked about. It's really important you, you kind of make that connection. And that's why I spent a bit of time on this. So now, let's talk about demographics since we, we talked about it. Um, Canada, like I said, as a, as a country, is growing faster than any other first world nation in the world. We by far uh, lead the world in population growth. Notwithstanding that, we have interprovincial migration, which most countries do. Uh, and that defines construction. Now, I'm from Toronto, and Toronto, uh, every single year, there's about 600,000 people that migrate from another country to Canada, and about 300, 250, 300,000 people settle within an hour of Toronto. That puts a tremendous demand on construction. That's a lot of people. So every, every three or four years, you're adding a million people to the greater Toronto area. So the demand for construction is absolutely enormous. It sucks a lot of the labor from around the world into that region. Not indifferent to what we saw in Fort McMurray with oil and gas. You know, it exploded. You know, how many Newfoundland, uh, Newfoundlanders were flying to Alberta to feed the labor pool? So you have to watch out for stuff like that because there are pockets of this country, whether it's resource-based, whether it's demographics, that are going to affect labor pools. <coughs> labor pools in this industry is really important. And I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir, right? How long have we been talking about labor shortage in this country? literally for the last decade, it's been five alarm fire. And it kind of tones down and the construction economy slows down, and then it picks up when it picks up. But the bottom line is, I'm gonna get ahead of a question that I usually get asked at forums like this, Mark, what is the biggest threat to the construction outlook, short term, mid term, long term? And people expect me to say, ah, you know, if Donald Trump gets reelected, that could really mess things up because this will happen, or it would fuel the US economy, so this will happen, or Geez, you know, if they go to war with Iran, that will affect this coronavirus. Honestly, <coughs> throw all that aside. The biggest threat to our industry, there's no question in my mind, is our ability to supply the labor to meet the demand. Because there's no question there's construction demand. There's no question. The demand for construction will be the highest long term this country's ever seen. Construction is a fast growing, robust, dynamically changing industry. And you're very fortunate to be part of it, especially the non residential sector. The problem we have is that our labor pools are shrinking at a more rapid rate every single day. I'll give you some context. Um, so this is the, the uh, percentage of people in our industry aged 55 or older. This is as of 2017. It's a little bit higher now. So as the years pass, our, our industry is aging. Now here's a fundamental problem we had. So when, I, when we started talking about this, I had the fortune of sitting on the CCA board years ago. We talked about it a lot then. I sit on the TCA board now for a few years. George Brown College, Algonquin College, Trades, trying to get young people into the schools. And I was very optimistic. I think somebody mentioned over breakfast today, you're kind of a half full kind of guy. I am a half full kind of guy. If you ask me back in 2010, 2011, I said, you know what, we gotta get into the schools, we gotta get people into the trades. It's really important. I can tell you right now, uh, whether it be as a Canadian who's logical or somebody who actually is a data geek, there is no possible way that we can feed the demand for construction domestically. It's impossible. It doesn't matter how many people, we, we can have the best, most effective marketing programs, we can have all hands on deck and invest unlimited money. The fact is we cannot get enough homegrown Canadians, you know, it doesn't matter what part of the demographic pool they're from, to feed the long-term demand and short-term demand for construction. And that kind of sucks on face value. There's no question. The only way we meet the demand of debt import, as well as developing, and I'll tell you why. Because the fact of the matter is, in 2015 in our country, it was the first year in our history that more people left the labor pool than entered it. So this is not just a construction problem, this is a tech problem, this is a healthcare problem, this is an agriculture problem, this is a services problem, this is a financial problem. Every single sector in Canada, labor pool is declining. Everyone. Now, construction is more pronounced, much more pronounced, because we're more aged. But the fact of the matter is, the Canadian labor pool is shrinking. This is why the government has taken a stance. We have to let people in. You've got to go around the world and bring skilled labor in. So what's happening is, every single industry, and I know this because I have three teenagers in high school, are flooding the school saying, you should get into tech, you should get into healthcare, you should get into construction, you should get into agriculture. And they're overwhelmed. My kids are overwhelmed. There's a dad and I have seats. People come in, they talk about getting into the trades, but oh, it's really cool. The tech sector is pretty cool. Right? 
So kids are being overwhelmed because there's demand for heavy marketing, and then we're, around, we're also lobbying the government saying we need more tradespeople. No, 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 we need more tech people. No, no, no. So this is a fight. This is a literally an industry <coughs> fight for labor. And our, the long-term health and sustainability of our industry depends on our ability to feed, to feed the labor pool. It's, it's, and I, I bring this up as part of my uh, presentation these days because it's important. It's important we understand that. Um, and it's probably the biggest battle cry this industry will ever have. Um, all right, so let's kind of, uh, let me just see, I want to talk a little bit about tech because it kind of ties into demographics. I'm not going to spend a lot on this. I do a lot of talking about this. Um, so we have a situation where we have an industry that's shrinking in labor, but the demand's going up. So the private sector are looking for ways to, in, to meet the demand of the private sector as well as the public sector. We want to build stuff. We just don't have enough people to build it. So what do we do? We're looking at technology more and more. We are a technology company. We actually have evolved from a media to data and now to a software uh, tech company. We're investing billions in this Facebook. We're, we're a very small player. Microsoft, Apple, Google, Oracle are investing more in the construction industry than any other industry. Why? Because you have an industry growing, especially in North America, growing faster than the industry that has tremendous demand. We've got to solve problems. I don't have enough people. I need, the tech serve, I need the tech industry to solve it. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I want to talk about 5G in a second. One example is, there was, and I, I meet all these people. Like I, the thing about being a, an information company, people from all over the world come to us and say, we're the projects because we want to put our drones on project sites. We want to put our robotics on project sites. So don't have enough laborers to tie a rebar on a bridge? Can't find people. What do you do? Um, you go and develop robotics to tie rebar. Um, that's how you solve the problem. So technology is not replacing people, it's solving a problem in our industry. So part of the problem is going to be solved with importing labor, because skilled trades are skilled trades. Right? You can't have robotics replace skilled trades. But robotics using uh, data and artificial intelligence, we are solving problems now at a much rapid rate. So this is forcing a lot of change in our industry. Another couple of phenomena are happening. Our market's wide open now. We have absolute wide open free trade with Europe. We have absolutely wide open free trade with uh, Southeast Asia, the Pan Pacific Trade Partnership. And of course we have NAFTA, which has been rewritten and I would argue that it hasn't really been rewritten, it's the same deal. But the point is that we have an open market, okay? We have a wide open market. So um, we were never really on the radar screen uh, as an industry, construction industry for the global market because our projects relatively were much smaller uh, historically than, say, in Europe. Europe always had mega projects, P3, alternative financing. They, they, they created that stuff. But it's changed now in Canada. You guys know that. The first technically terror project in Canadian history over its lifetime is Muskrat Falls, Churchill Falls. It's the largest construction project in the history of Canada. If you put it across its whole lifespan, it would be the first terror project, trillion dollar project, over its lifetime. Um, we have, we have, we, right now, as a data company, we are tracking $300 billion plus projects in Canada, a lot around the resource sector. We're planning on putting $5 billion office towers in downtown Toronto. These are massive, massive projects. To put that into context, 10 years ago, we were going to be tracking 20, 10, right, in any given year. So what that done is it's attracted the world. Consortia from Europe, uh, Chinese companies, U U.S. companies, and they're coming here saying, I want to get involved in Churchill Falls, I want, but I don't want to build it like you guys build it. I want to use technology. I want to use drones. I want to use robotics. Um, and they're forcing, they're, that's another uh, force of change for us. So um, sh shrinking labor pools, increasing demand, larger, more complex projects, international competition is causing technology and technology companies to invest billions in our space. And I could do a whole session on this, I swear. It's fascinating what's going on. But I will tell you this, and, and I like to put shocking statements out there because I want you to think. Our industry in the next five years, in terms of technological innovation and uh, infiltration in our processes, the way we build, how we build, what we use to build, will change more in the next five years than it has in the last 50 years. That's how rapid change is going to be. And one of the biggest catalysts of that will be 5G. Now, 5G, right now we all live in a 3G world, right? Our, our, our phones. These phones are pretty powerful. They're more powerful than what we put a man on the moon with back in 1969. Way more powerful. Um, and everybody has one. Now, I want to talk about 5G because 5G will be as impactful to the human race 
and more impactful to our industry as the birth of the internet, the birth of the vehicle, the car. We will look back on 5G as a transformational techno technological change for our industry, as well as the world. Why? Here's some context. I just want to point this out because this gives you some context. Right now, in our world, if you want to download a movie, it takes four and a half minutes to your phone. In a 5G world, it takes 1.2 seconds. Now, what does that mean? Right now, there's technology waiting for the construction industry. It's only limited by our ability to uh, handle the data. Okay, so in the next three years, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver will be completely 5G. And within five years, all of Canada. So pretty much the first phase of the big three cities. Like, literally, there's a race between Bell, Rogers, uh, Huawei, to, to 5G in the entire country. So what you can do now is you can create a 5G network within a construction industry standalone or a project. A project can actually be a 5G network. And what that means now is you can use drones, you can use artificial intelligence, you can capture a lot of data. You can, so for example, Caterpillar, I know they're, they're a sponsor here. I know Caterpillar very well, my brother works with Caterpillar, are, are investing billions, literally billions, on autonomous heavy equipment for construction. They're already using it in mining. Why? Not enough operators. So how do you solve the problem? Make the machines autonomous. Operate them out of a control center. In Toronto, we don't have, there are more cranes in the downtown core of Toronto than anywhere in the world right now. Second time it's happened in the last five years. There's not enough client crane operators. If you're a crane operator, you get very rich in Toronto because they name your price. In Japan, they solved that problem by having one control center operating all the cranes in Tokyo. Right? That's how you solve labor shortage problems and control prices. So 5G is the only limitation. Once 5G is born, everything changes. Artificial intelligence, virtual reality, data capture. There are GCs in this country I know because I, I, I go to their AGMs that are looking at ways they can use drones, robotics, uh, real-time data capture on the construction site to solve a lot of the problems with labor shortage. And I bring this up because it's important because your industry is going to change so fast, so fast in the next five years. And the birth the catalyst will be 5G. In, in the province, uh, and keep an eye out for that. All right, so let's kind of step back into construction now. Um, let me come back here to the beginning. So we talked about, this is Canada, I'm going to get into Newfoundland and Labrador now, but I want to give you the big picture. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> okay, that's the Italian me, right? <laughs> Um, these, are, these, are, these are pretty big year-over-year -year growth numbers. So people say, whoa, those are, that's a good year. You've got to remember, 19 was a really down year from construction year-over-year. -year. We had some pretty significant year-over-year -year declines in construction. Now, why was that the case? Why do we have such big... So when, because 19 was so low, you're coming off... You're, you're starting a new cycle in construction. And the, the trend is definitely true in Newfoundland and Labrador. I'll show you the same pattern. But 19 was a big year of decline over 18, and the primary catalyst was infrastructure investment. So um, I know CCA and all the provincial associations and the, and the local mixed trade association and the vertical associations worked very hard for a long time to convince all levels of government, you need to invest in infrastructure. Our infrastructure is aging, it's getting old, and this is certainly true in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, some of the most aged infrastructure in this country. So huge commitments to infrastructure spending over the last five years, provincially, municipally, and nationally. So massive projects, especially in uh, heavy civil, okay? Uh, especially in transportation, all these projects reach their substantial completion stage, and then you have a big drop in 19. So now you got a new wave of investment coming in. Some of the resource sectors driving this, oil and gas, certainly in your province, a major investment in oil and gas right across this country, anywhere there's oil and gas, Alberta, you're seeing some revitalization and investment there. You're seeing some heavy prospecting in the resource sector, so mega projects. So it's another big year of cycling up. So we expect a big growth year for construction in 2020 based on what we're seeing on the data side, but we're coming off a down year in 19. So let's get into the regional forecast. Let's talk about your province now. So, one of the things that's happening is the demand for oil and gas is on the rise. Um, it's happening in a number of places. I mean, part of it, I think, what's happening in your province is in Europe. Europe's coming out of this sleepy, sick decade, you know, where, where they had the uh, 2008 to 2018, where they had uh, the European economic crisis post-2008 uh, financial crisis. Brexit is... <laughs> 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 
Uh, Brexit has certainly slowed down uh, the growth, but the fact is Europe's demanding more oil. They're buying less from Russia. And I think what's happening is they're looking at places like Canada to, to supply their, their oil and gas needs. It's a little more expensive, but it's a little more secure than Russia. Um, and that's actually, I get that from a very important source. My cousin sits on the European Union, he represents Malta. And he says the EU is looking at buying more resources and oil and gas from Canada than they're buying from Russia. They want to flip the switch just because of the tensions in Ukraine and stuff. So that's actually from a source directly in the European Union and Belgium. It's kind of cool. But uh, so Europe with free trade and openness in markets and the ability to get access to our market are looking at our oil and gas more than they are uh, the traditional supply of Russia. So demand for oil and gas is up. Therefore, you've seen huge investment in offshore. Uh, and you've seen that in the last year. I'll get into some of the projects. Your GDP has lifted as a result. You've had some nice growth. As a matter of fact, in 2019, Newfoundland and Labrador, for a period of time, was leading the country in GDP growth provincially. Uh, I don't think it ended there, but it was actually showing a pretty good growth here. Um, nickel is very interesting. You guys are very rich in nickel. The demand for nickel and lithium, this is a stock tip, you should buy a nickel and lithium stock. And I'll tell you why, because we, in our history of our country, we have never pro prospected more or had more interest in, in exploiting our nickel and lithium reserves than we are right now. And the reason for that is, you need nickel and lithium to create batteries, batteries that will power electric vehicles. And the demand for electric vehicles is at an all-time high. In China and India, they plan to grandfather out diesel and gas within the next five years, and you might be saying, well, what's that going to do our own gas industry? By the time we, we will need oil and gas for the next 100 years to 150 years, it's not, there's still going to be predominantly gas and uh, gas vehicles in China and India, but they're going to stop selling them uh, within the next five years as part of the Paris Accord. But the bigger one is there's other phenomena happening, and this is certainly true in Newfoundland and Labrador. We have dug so deep in the Earth's core to extract minerals, we've gotten so deep we can no longer extract minerals where there's air, so we can no longer use diesel. This is right from my uh, Brothers in intelligence and catapult. So how do you get minerals deeper in the earth? You need, to, you need to make them autonomous and you need to make them electric. So now a lot of the heavy equipment that's being developed for in, uh, mining extraction deeper in the earth's core is electric. So the demand for nickel and the demand for lithium is increasing rapidly and will continue to increase for a long time. And Newfoundland, Newfoundland specifically in Labrador is well positioned for that. I think your nickel extraction and expand growth will be sustainable for the, for the uh, future. So GDP is on the rise, primarily being driven by resources. And I think what you're probably going to tell me is, yeah, but 19 was a tough year. You know, housing starts were down, um, commercial construction was down, building permits were down. <coughs> Let me just get the glasses on here. This is way too small. Um, and you know, employment was up. A lot of a lot of employment growth in the resource sector, but construction employment was down. And there's a reason for that because construction lags, right? So here's basically what happens. In enemy province, when, when, it, when an economy starts to grow, it creates wealth. Wealth creates demand, but the demand doesn't come right away. Especially in your province, where people are a little more speculative, they say, you know what, I'm not sure it's going to last. This might be a blip. But generally, if you have sustained growth and you have sustained wealth creation, people start investing money, they start buying houses, they start creating their houses. It's just a natural phenomenon. This is why economies cycle. And right now, you're starting a new cycle in Newfoundland, as far as I'm concerned. All indications uh, suggest that. Not just with employment, but um, you're seeing it with GDP. On the housing start side, <coughs> you're seeing it with your housing starts as well. You see the cycles, right? This is all confidence. I guarantee you, if you map this to Newfoundland and Labrador confidence, consumer confidence, this would follow the exact same path, right? Uh, you, get, you get confidence down, your economy probably was really slow and it starts to pick up because the oil and gas industry took off. I remember talking to you guys during those times. Everything was great. Housing prices were rising, housing starts were up, unemployment was decreasing. But all of a sudden, oil and gas, oil and gas prices fall, investment stops, resource sector slows down, you stop building houses. This is all consumer confidence. So there's a construction lag behind the growth. And it lags because people are on a wait and see attitude. These are consumers. Right? So when it comes to housing starts and it comes to economic trends, you're starting a new cycle. On the resource sector, um, in terms of value of mineral shipments, you see, you see the, the pickup in 19, we talked about the reasons why. That's expected to continue to rise. There's some pretty significant investment being in, in, the, in the resource sector. I'll talk about some of the projects. Offshore oil, 
Again, you're seeing the cycle. It's coming back. Demand's increasing. Now, what could accelerate this or what could disrupt it? China. China consumes a lot of resources. As a matter of fact, there's no country in the world right now that consumes more resources than China. They've surpassed the U.S. It's really important. It's what affects prices. So if the Chinese economy is negatively affected by coronavirus in the next four months, this could change. Their, their demand goes down, oil prices fall, the investment stops. If we, if we get, if the coronavirus turns into be no worse than a common cold uh, outbreak, then this is going to increase because China, especially with China, especially in the next year, which you'd expect, as you get closer to the election, I guarantee you this, as you get closer to the election, the U.S. will announce a major deal with China as you get closer to the election because it's going to be politically prudent for the existing government to announce to the world that U.S.-China relations, especially trade relations, are bad. And that will happen soon. So you got to watch this stuff. That will affect you guys. That will affect oil prices. That will affect the billions and billions of dollars that are being invested in offshore oil and in, in, in the world. Um, when you talk about some of the projects in, in Newfoundland Labrador, I think they did a good job making, some, uh, making this visual. But, but, but you look at the, the nature of the projects, Voices Bay Mining, you got some major development happening there, more billions of dollars being invested in the iron ore project. For all the reasons I mentioned, the demand for resources is increasing, uh, prospecting is at an all-time high in this country. I'll give you some context of that. Let me see if I can find it. Exploration, investment. So this is the long-term, best case, worst case investment in mining. We pay attention to this because I've been talking about mining for a long time. Mining is really important for, uh, in the construction industry. Certainly important to your province. They're big, they're remote, they demand a lot of labor, they're long-term, they're ongoing. So when you talk about demand on labor pools, you've got to pay attention to this stuff. But exploration right now is at an all-time high. Um, you, 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 you have tremendous, tremendous mine development and exploration in this country that we've never seen before. And that's usually a leading indicator. It usually means that people believe the demand for resources are going up. So you, you increase exploration and you increase investment. And then you watch the construction come after that. <coughs> and that's certainly true in, in Newfoundland and Labrador right now because what's happening in Newfoundland and Labrador is... Um, let me just find my... I'm back here. Um, What's happening in Newfoundland and Labrador is you're seeing some really big investment in the resource sector, which is driving your GDP growth, labor uh, growth, uh, but the economy is lagging a little bit, especially construction. Year over year, 19, you wouldn't know this is happening. If you looked at the construction metrics in 19 in Newfoundland and Labrador versus 18, compared, it, it almost seemed to be going in a different direction than GDP. If you looked at GDP growth, GDP growth was rising, unemployment was decreasing, but if you look at construction metrics, permits were down, uh, permits were down, construction employment was down, non-residential construction starts were down, because you guys lag behind the economy. So I expect, based on all that, I expect 2020, all things are meaning equal, this, you'll see a rise in construction. You'll see a rise in employment, you'll see a rise in permits year over year, you'll see a rise versus 1980. I don't know what I'm doing, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, um, <coughs> Again, as long as the global economy cooperates. You're, you're starting a new construction cycle. There's uh, $500 billion in infrastructure investment, which has been committed, a $3 billion long-term infrastructure committed by the province. Now, that will continue to flow. Uh, private sector's investing. That will bring uh, out-of-province investment. It will increase consumer confidence, and generally that's what drives construction. That's what will pick up a new cycle and we'll start to see growth. But again, you guys know as well as anybody, change like that. Like that. Uh, <laughs> um, so you got that's the short-term challenge of our industry. Okay, so um, let me, uh, how am I doing for time, Ron? Yeah, about five minutes. Okay, and I always want to leave time for questions. Okay, so I, yeah, I think I, one thing I will mention is this, this is important. This is a current view of the provinces, where they stand in terms of um, how they're balancing their books. And, and this is really important for our industry. Now, I don't know if you recall, I, I put this up the last few years. Um, a year ago, there were a lot of access here, including Newfoundland and Labrador. The only ones that had a green check mark, which means they were at, at, at budget or surplus, was Quebec and BC. BC has been in surplus for a long time. 
you're seeing more and more provinces become balanced, which is great. The reason why that's important for our industry is that when we talk about infrastructure investment, we talk about transit, we talk about improving our roads, our ports, which make our economies go, which are we're desperate for investment. You have to look at the provinces and the federal government's ability to fund it. And right now, again, I'm not optimistic, I will tell you this, that we need more infrastructure than we can afford. This is true in Newfoundland Labrador, this is true in St. John's, this is true in Toronto, this is true in Ontario, it's true everywhere. We need more infrastructure than we can afford. And it's not something that we can fix in a year or two with a lot of investment, it's like 20 years, 30 years of investment. So you look at this because you say to yourself, how confident are we that the provinces are really going to be able to afford the infrastructure we need? Well, when you see check marks, you're a little more confident, but I can tell you this, we will not be able to afford the infrastructure in this country that we need because we have two problems. We need to modernize our infrastructure because it's aged and we need to expand it. I mean, we need bigger ports, we need to handle more ability to ship oil, we need, to, we need more resources to get out to the market, we need, we need bigger roads, better roads, better bridges, we need more trans, rapid transit, multi, 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 multi billion dollar projects. And there's no way we can afford it without the private sector. So it doesn't matter what you think about P3 and alternative financing, the bottom line is if we're going to invest in growth, we talk about, we talk about labor and our ability to, to meet the demands, the only way we're going to really truly build the infrastructure we need is going to be through alternative financing and private, private sector, P3. And we have to get used to that. I think that's going to evolve over time. I think it's going to become more prolific with smaller projects and it's going to attract more people internationally. Because there's a lot of companies that have lived in the P3 model, especially in Europe. So we have to pay attention to that. Um, and that's really important. And then also there's indirect taxing too. Like they can't tax us anymore to build more bridges. So for example, I'll use my, my example of Toronto. They, they won't tax us anymore, but they will toll us. They will toll us like crazy. Anytime you use a road, you're going to pay. That's just the way it's going to be. And that's our future. That's how you pay for all this buildup. Because our demand... I, I, I don't have time to get into it, but I can show you some really strong data. We have most of our infrastructure is well beyond its half-life. If you couple that with interprovincial migration and migration from other countries, we need more infrastructure. We need to, so how, how we pay for it is I think, important. And it's important you realize that the trend towards private invest, uh, private sector investment is real. Alright, I'll quickly end on this. Short term, Newfoundland Labrador, uh, Canada. I think uh, generally we're starting a new construction cycle, a new growth period. This is certainly true of Newfoundland Labrador. You're going to feel the positive effects of GDP growth in the province over the last year, year and a half. The investment that comes with it, the confidence, as long as it's not disrupted in the next 12 months, you will see permits increase. You will see construction employment increase. You will see um, non-residential construction increase. And it will sustainably increase as long as the confidence is there. That's short term. Or something's going to happen. Pandemic, uh, uh, backlash from U.S. election, which will slow down the Canadian economy, which will slow down confidence and disrupt the forecast. Short term is very cloudy. Mid long term, the demand for resources uh, will continue to benefit your province, especially nickel, iron, ore, and any of the other uh, resources you have, um, and that will have a long term positive effect on your province. I think uh, for the foreseeable future at an increasing rate. Thank you so much.
and one just finished high school. And they all were exposed to people coming in talking about the benefits of getting into the trades. And different messages, you know, the, the road builders would come in and send a different message than the sewer water main, and then the next trade would come in. And, and this is their view, and, 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 it's, and I, this is where I think messages get lost. They said, Dad, here's the bottom line. This is what we talk about our friend, amongst our friends. And it's sad, actually. It's sad. But this is exactly what they told me. They said, you know, everybody wants to be a doctor, an engineer, because it's, you know, there's sexy professions. You can make a lot of money doing those jobs. It's all about money, whatever. They said, you know, trades are something you fall back on if you don't want to go to university. There's still that impression. And it's sad because I said to them, the bottom line is, is that being in the trades in this country over the next generation is going to be one of the most exciting professions because it's going to be all tech. It's going to be 100% tech. These guys, they're all gamers. It's going to be tech, robotics, artificial intelligence. Um, they go, really? They, go, yeah. they didn't send that message. You know, it's, it's dirty, it's unsafe, <laughs> this is what the teachers are telling us. No, it's actually going to be very technical, very. Uh, it's going to be right in the middle of the tech world, the next, next major tech world. So I, I think a lot of the message gets lost at the high school, so I think that's a problem. And I have a theory, actually. Though. We were talking about this at the TCA board. We're talking about getting more women into construction. And I realized this with my daughter. I said, if the biggest recruitment vehicle for the U.S. Air Force and history of U.S. Air Force was, guess what? Top Gun. Top Gun was the biggest recruitment vehicle in the history of the U.S. Air Force. The biggest recruitment vehicle for U.S. Fire, firefighters in general was backdraft. So what happens with young kids, and this is true, and I, I remember this, is they need, they need to see themselves in that job, right? I said, if you want to get more women in construction, give them role models, right? Literally, my daughter was thinking about becoming an architect because she, got in, she, she fell in love and became completely addicted to the Home and Garden Network. She wanted to design houses. I think young people need to see themselves doing that. And right now, young women don't see themselves in construction because there's no role models. Young, young men don't see themselves in construction because we don't, we don't expose the individuals. So for example, Mike Holmes, right? You guys know who Mike Holmes is? A lot of controversy in that with that guy because I, mean, I know- Five, six years ago, he started doing the police studies in St. John's. So he was rolling the police studies program. And you know, from the time he was two years old, uh, he used to say, you know, I'm out here. The mountains are good trade, the mountains are good trade, the mountains are good trade. Yeah. And anyway, he got to the third year and he flunked it. So it was, a, it was a, a, an opening eye moment for me, I guess. So I said to him, I said, Cody, like, why aren't you doing this? Dad, that was your dream, not mine. Wow. Man. <sighs> wow. It's <coughs> written our kids. You know, I, I don't know if anybody talked their kids in, you know, at night and said, you know something, when you grow up, you're going to learn how to offer a jackhammer. I'll build it forever, right? Yeah. We don't do that, right? So it's probably our own fault as parents sometimes. That yeah, is, well, we just don't script them. We just don't have that belief in what you said there about Top Gun. is absolutely true. But they yeah. see themselves in that cockpit. They see themselves flying that jet. Can you count us on ER, like TV show yeah. ER, or yeah. George Clooney? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what that He's a power engineer now, by the way. Yeah, there you go. So, people wanted to get into the medical profession because there was an entire generation that watched that show. So yeah. recruitment in med school went way up. Right. Because young people watch the show and they, you know. So do you agree with the message that we're giving our kids? No. No, it's not getting through. It's not getting through. We're spending millions of dollars and it's not getting through. We should be promoting the industry. We should be promoting the individuals in the industry. We should be showing them role models. That's what the young kids Because the kids don't see themselves. The kids don't see themselves as, um, like my son said, he said, Dad, basically the general consensus on construction in my high school is that if you don't finish high school or you don't really want to go to college or university, get into the trades. Right. Yeah. And that's so wrong. I said, you, you know, it's going to be a tech industry. If you're in the trades, you're going to be using robotics and drones and, and artificial intelligence. He goes, really? He must be an engineer. He got him thinking, right? So we have to be careful in terms of how I think we I think I think we need to understand what these kids are thinking. I think we just say get the trades, get the trades, we make a lot of money, get the trades. Right. It'd be no, a lot of jobs out. <laughs> just not going deep enough to the no, no. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, everybody. See you.